a Poundland insect zapping bat. I'm pretty sure I've taken a look at one of these before, but I thought, let's buy another one and see if it's changed. So, of course, I have to make obligatory zapping noises. I shall use this dangerously all metal object in there to just book and short out the terminals. Are we getting much of a spark? We're getting a, a decent little spark there. It's not that exciting. And the spark doesn't last long enough to actually get caught in the frame. Let's say, does this hold a charge? Oh, it does hold a slight charge. So the idea of these, of course, is that you've got the uh, positive and negative frame, for lack of a better description here. High voltage across them, and if insects can fly into them, then if they bridge the two or get close to them, it will zap across. And I have to say, I have tried measuring the voltage on this. I'm not sure that was a good idea. The meter I used goes up to 600 volts. It did not measure the voltage. It was more than 600 volts. So let's open it up. That's what we're here for. The gloves are on again, not because of electrical safety or that, just because, well, skin problems. But that's in the past soon. That'll all be over shortly. It's all healing up now. These things happen. So it's held together with one, two, three, four, five screws, which must have broken the hearts of their accounts department. I'm guessing the reason for the five screws is that they've got three here just for the strength of the bat end, because people are swiping and swinging this thing around. I kind of preferred the older version of this because the older version, the first ones that came out just had lines across of alternate polarity, so there's nothing to impede the flow of insects or indeed fingers, and those ones seem to be quite popular in the fetish circles as spanking paddles for extra zap when they spank each other with them, which does kind of show a distinct lack of understanding of electricity, but that's okay. Let's get this off. Inside is a small circuit board. I'm actually kind of surprised there's three wires going up to this, but there's one going to the middle mesh, there's one going to the two outer meshes. Uh, the reason there's two outer meshes and not a middle mesh is that if someone grabbed it like that, if there was just two meshes, they'd get a shock off that. So the circuit board itself, let's zoom down here. If I may actually just laterally, I may... Should I zoom up on this? But tell you what, I shall reverse engineer. So let's get this out first because I don't see any screws here. I think it's just held in by the battery terminals which are soldered directly onto it. Let's hoik this out. It's in very stiffly. I'm beginning to wonder if there are screws, but I'm not seeing any. It's out. What do we have? We have output capacitor. It's not got a voltage multiplier. Right, tell you what, I'm going to pause momentarily and we'll reverse engineer this. So before I show you the schematic, now I've reversed engineered it, let's take a look at the circuit board itself. The most notable thing here, it's a specialist transformer, that little transistor is quite important, it's quite a beefy little transistor, which turns out to be an amplifier transistor for amplifiers, old-fashioned ones. This little clicky button here, which has taken quite a lot of current, it's got the battery contacts, two 560 ohm resistors, that's green, blue, uh, brown. Uh, and this end, we've got the transformer, we've got a diode, we've got this capacitor here, a big fat capacitor, and then a discharge resistor of a suspiciously small rating. Let's go down to there, because that's where we really want to be right now. Here is the schematic. It's very simple. I don't think much has changed. If anything, they've cheapened it a bit by just using one uh, capacitor stage. So let's start at the very beginning. Battery supply comes in. It's just three volts. All they're really wanting here is a high current primary supply. We've got the button here, which then connects the rest of the circuit. There is a 560 ohm resistor, little 8th watt resistors, uh, passing current through an LED. They've just chosen two, two 560 ohm resistors just for uniformity. It would be this one that actually determined the value of that one because it's just the most critical value. We have a custom mount transformer with a transistor and a... a Two primary windings, roughly measuring 1.5 ohms each, not very big windings at all. One of those is designed to pass a lot of current uh, when the transistor turns on. One is designed as feedback, and this higher resistance winding, or higher impedance winding, is 150 ohm, and it's the high voltage winding. So what hap actually happens here is, when you turn it on, some current flows through this resistor, and this winding to this transistor. The transistor starts turning on when it does start turning on. Current flows through this uh, 
winding, which because of the arrangement of the windings results in higher base current because it actually increases the voltage across here and it results in a higher sort of gate base drive for that transistor because it is a standard NPN transistor. It's a C2328A, which is rated 30 volts, 2 amp, 1 watt, but is used in 3 watt amplifiers where it's not being used continuously. That's its original purpose. It does have a complementary PNP transistor for the push-pull arrangement of vintage amplifiers. I say vintage, I mean seriously. Digital amplifiers have just taken over everything these days. The circuit, uh, the, so the current uh, passes through the transistor, passes through this primary winding, gets feedback, but as soon as it's saturated the transformer, the, as soon as it can't get more sort of current flow, well, magnetic field into the transformer, the coupling CC, uh, slows down and this uh, coil starts reducing the input to the base, whereupon it has an avalanche effect and sort of it, the uh, transformer then effectively discharges its magnetic field. And then once it's a, a collapsed completely, then the whole cycle starts again. In the meantime, uh, I guess it might be a flybacky circuit that it initially puts a charge in and then this one takes it out in the secondary side. That would make sense. So this is the high voltage winding, which is just higher number of turns, and it goes through a diode, which looks a bit like a 1N4007, but is probably a high speed uh, 1 amp diode. Let's just say 1 amp diode, let's guess 1000 volts, couldn't read the text on it, and we'll just say high speed because that'll make it more efficient. I don't know if it is high speed. Some of them have used ordinary diodes and they're not ideal for those sudden spikes. The capacitor is, where is the circuit? What have I done with it? Where have I placed it? There it is. The capacitor is a standard sort of, well, it's used in capacitive droppers, it's used for suppression, it's a generic capacitor, and it's only rated 330 nanofarad at 630 volts. So that gets charged up by this, and it does go above 600 volts because my meter didn't like it. Across that is a 2.2 mega ohm quarter watt resistor to act, it's to discharge this, I mean, th theoretically it's not really needed. It will also probably cap the maximum voltage because as soon as the voltage goes above a certain level, that will start conducting more and it will just balance it off. However, the main purpose is to make sure this mesh gets discharged when you let go of the button and it brings it back down to zero volts so that people just finger it with their hands, don't get little nips off it, presumably. It kind of reduces the efficiency of the circuit though. And it also makes me realise that I suppose if you you can't power these bats continually. These circuits are only designed for sort of brief pulses of use because that transistor will get quite warm in the duty it's doing. But theoretically, if you wanted, you could adapt this to mains with a simple voltage multiplier. I've just hooked this in my gloves. With a simple voltage multiplier pumping up a similar capacitor to about the 600 volt mark. I was expecting a higher voltage, but you know, it doesn't matter. 600 volts is enough. It makes that pop, but will the insects when they bridge it will get zapped? It will just won't jump as far as a standard sort of insect cuter thing. I'd guess it would only jump about one millimeter, but uh, their wings, they probably come quite close. So, well, it certainly seems to work. So there we have it. Super simple circuit, useful for certain components. A uh, nice, interesting grid. It just makes you wonder how do they make it for that cost? And the answer is mass production because they're selling that for a pound. I'm not sure what the current exchange rate is, but less than one and a half dollars. And I think there's a good chance in places like America they probably sell these in dollar stores too. But interesting. Lots of work in making it. Just all these layers of metal mesh and the plastic and the circuitry. And yet they still put it out for that just because it is a mass produced item. So there you go. The Poundland Insect Zapping Bat.